the nostalgia critic guy remembered so you don't have to. Let's talk a little history. <laughs> Shut up, you gotta learn something! In 1862, Anna Leah Owens was given the opportunity to teach the many wives and children of Mungkut, the King of Siam. She accepted and later wrote a series of memoirs about her experience called The English Governess at the Siamese Court. The memoirs were controversial, to say the least. Many saying she exaggerated or downright fabricated her influence on the king, and that she reduced a man who was a Buddhist monk for 27 years into a cruel, extreme, even violent monarch. Years later, Margaret Landon wrote a fictionalized, or even more fictionalized version, called Anna and the King of Siam, again reinforcing Anna as the revolutionary and Mungkut as the harsh, eccentric ruler. Thailand finally said, Hey! We've had it up to here with your bullshit! We're going to write our own version for English readers, which will later become Mungkut, the King of Siam and our writings will be placed in the Library of Congress for all you readers to see the truth. Maybe then, America will know the true history of our beloved king. God damn it! Rogers and Hammerstein's The King and I came out, glorifying Landon's book and making her story more popular than it's ever been. So the controversy about telling only one side of the story continued from here on. But then another adaptation came out, this time in animated form, under the same name, The King and I. Getting to know you, getting to know all about you. Animated by Warner Brothers and released in 1999, this movie surely would offer a new outlook on history and myth, not unlike something like The Prince of Egypt did taking a relatively famous tale but updating it with modern dramatic storytelling while still coming from a different but respectful point of view. Perhaps Thailand's dignified look on their beloved king will finally come to light. So, tell me, how does this look back on history begin? What is it, mother? A dragon! This is the king and I. Did I see that right? I mean, did I really see that right? A dragon? We're starting off the king and I with a fucking dragon? What band of bum deeds produced this cinematic idiocy? Oh, gee! Now it makes sense! Rankin Bass. The same animation team who made those stop motion specials that put more emphasis on the stop than the motion and produced a whole slew of what I like to call awkwardmation. The cartoons that were never good, but you were just so fascinated by how strangely they moved that you had no choice but to keep watching. This film doesn't even have that distinction. It has good animation. To an extent. It's good Warner Brothers animation trying to be good Disney animation, resulting in bad Warner Brothers animation. But honestly, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. Let's look at how this film begins. The governess is being transported to Thailand during a nasty storm. Clearly, she's already doing a bang-up duty of her job as her son is climbing the edge of the boat for his pet monkey. I'm sure she'll do great looking after those kids. I should have known it was your fault. Lewis, are you all right? Mia, Mia on the wall, who's the loosest adaptation of all? I'll use this English school teacher to help me dethrone the king. Actually, this is the Prime Minister Kralahorn. In the original film, he's a stone-faced traditionalist who believes in the old way trying to help the king run a good government, but still keep true to his traditions. This one comes pretty close. Here he's an evil wizard who wants to dethrone the king by using his magic powers to take over all of Siam. Oh, and the Japanese didn't fire at hospitals. Why? What? Upon hearing that the school teacher is arriving, he comes up with a plan so evil that it makes rats jump out of his shadow. You heard right. Rats jump out of his shadow. I'll cleverly convince her that our king is a barbarian! <laughs> Isn't that like one of the missing Grinch lyrics? You're a mean one. Crawl home. You have rats in your shadow. You dance as horribly as our drunk Ricky Ricardo. Crawl home. Thank God the person this is based on is dead, and he has no estate to sue you, because if they could, they probably would. No, I don't get it. You're right, but you go explain to me now, huh? He also has a sidekick played by Daryl Hammond named Master Little. Why does he have a sidekick in this version? Because everybody has a funny little sidekick in this movie. In fact, we can probably just go ahead and start the funny little sidekick count. 
the monkey, most racist interpretation since breakfast at Tiffany's, the dragon, okay, we won't count him. But yeah, I'd say let's address the white elephant in the room, but we don't need to. It's one of the funny little sidekicks coming up. What is it? And speaking of awkwardness that needs to be addressed, Prowlerhome does indeed send a dragon to attack them, which doesn't make sense seeing how a second ago he said he wanted her for his plans. So why is he trying to scare her away? But thankfully, Anna has a foolproof way to fight him off. Whistling! You heard right. In fact, I'm gonna be saying that phrase a lot in this review. I'm just gonna have it on standby. She starts whistling. Mother, what are you doing? I'm whistling. That's what I do when I'm afraid. Which, of course, leads into the famous song. Whenever I feel afraid, I hold my head erect and whistle a happy tune so no one will suspect I'm afraid. Now, in the original, she tells her son that she whistles because she's afraid to meet the king, and sometimes her nerves get to her. Here, it's a friggin' dragon! Kill it with fire, spears, rocks, but not a musical number! You should be singing about the wonders of a semi-automatic! I whistle a happy tune, and every single time... Oh, and twirling. Yes, twirling will confuse the savage beast! Where dinosaurs always base their sight on movement, dragons apparently base their sight on not movement. So I guess they eat a lot of rocks. But you want to know the really bizarre thing about all of this? And trust me, it's not an easy sentence to say considering what we put on screen. No, no. The really bizarre thing about all of this is... IT WORKS! Yeah, the monster disappears. Oh, I guess whistling and twirling are now permanent additions to the naval defense! Oh my god, a monster! You know what to do! So they make it to Epcot Thailand, where Anna is finally introduced to the king, his high-fiving panther, his penis's resume, their cuddly sidekicks, and of course, his possible multiple wives? Yeah, in the original there's no mistake, they're definitely his wives, but here they never clarify whether these are wives or servants. I guess either way it doesn't matter, as we can just assume he's putting his dick in them, but still, a little clarity would be nice. While one of the newer servants is shown around the palace, she comes across her own cuddly playmate. I shall call you Tusker. <laughs> and the king's eldest son, Liu Kang. Tusker? Who are you? An object, like rug given to king. Oh good, I'm glad you know that. You see, usually I have to talk to girls and treat them like individuals, but you seem to be ahead of the game. But Tai Jafar, it turns out, seems to have a new sinister plan. If the boy gets hurt, the king will be blamed. We going to mess him up. So, first it was make the king look like a barbarian to Anna, then it was scare Anna away with a dragon, now it's try to kill Anna's son? You're like a one-man political debate, you can't stay agreed on anything! You lack focus. Crawl home. You need some Adderall. Right to face one of those. Darn it all. All right, you villain. Take this right now. So while most of the audience refills their popcorn, because clearly they know the next two minutes is nothing but this, Shang Tsung decides to write a letter to the British fleet to make it look like the king is treating Anna horribly. Oh, Sir Edmund, there's a letter for you. Really? Oh, oh. Follow that letter. <laughs> Twelve trees died to give you that scene, folks. Was it worth it? Where to? Siam. To dethrone a barbaric king. We got a random letter. Let's destroy a nation! But of course, Anna is fine, but apparently having trouble teaching her pupils. Huh? Siam is not so small. Oh, but look. England's even smaller. But Royal Palace is center of whole universe. <laughs> You know, the irony is that this misunderstanding of history from delusional people at the top who think they're always right can just as easily be translated into American film animation. I mean, really think about it. 
So let us begin with the history of Thailand culture. Thailand culture come from Big Dragon. Big Dragon decide who live and who die. And those left created Thailand. All right, um, why don't we come back to Thailand history? Let's instead look at American history. Ah, American history. John Smith saved my full grown Indian princess. They have romance and talk to singing tree. All right, we'll come back to that too. What do you know about Russian history? Rasputin. Yes? Was an evil wizard with a talking bat who cast spells on another pretty princess. Pretty princesses make up most of world history. You know, let's take a break and I'll read to you from some English literature. Like the little mermaid who sacrifices her life and- She lives in the end. Okay. It's a very ancient saying, but a true and honest thought. So this leads to the musical's most famous song, and coincidentally, the most annoying. Getting to know you, putting it my way, but nicely. Oh. You are precisely my cup of tea. Thank God, once again, the focus isn't on the interaction of the characters or their relationships, but rather an excuse to have the comic relief distract us with their rushed, dumbass humor. This serves especially humorous here, as the song is entitled Getting to Know You, and yet, by paying more attention to the dragons, animals, and comedic antics, I don't know anything about these people! It's like everything that should be in the foreground is in the background, and everything that should be in the background is in the foreground. I mean, it's like people focusing more on the color of the wall than the person actually in front of it. Really, guys? Really? Okay, well, um, let's go to commercial while I try to fix this. Oh, no, no, no! Clearly, this is really important! Like, the show can't go on with this abomination behind me. I mean, here I thought the most important thing about the Nostalgia Critic was the Nostalgia Critic. But no, it's the color of the fucking wall. That's the glue that held everything together. So, I'll be right back. We're gonna go to commercial. No, 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 it's too important. We're gonna go to commercial while I try to fix this atrocity back here. Oh God, what was I thinking? White! From the King and I, the musical your parents tried to show you after forcing you to watch Sound of Music, comes the 57th anniversary recording of the classic Rodgers and Hammerstein's music, featuring Hollywood's latest groundbreaking musical discovery, Russell Crowe. Getting to know you, getting to know all about you, getting to like you, Getting to hope you, like me! Behold, the musical sensation from Les Miserables, and whatever the hell band he's in, delighting the world with his angelic instrument. Whenever I'm afraid, I hold my head erect, we're so happy tune, so no one will suspect I'm afraid! I can't whistle. A cut, cut recording. Uh, Russell, what seems to be the problem? Uh, I can't whistle, Paul. Oh, that's okay. We'll just dub over it in post. Mm -hmm. Nobody dubs over me, Paul. We'll just rewrite the music so I can sing it easier. I think that might be a little disrespectful to the original material. Nonsense. Perhaps you didn't hear my incredible performance in Les Miserables. I did. That's why I was a little concerned. All the critics praised me. They said they never heard anything like it. If Anne Hathaway didn't get the Academy Award, I maybe would have had that supporting actress. Now rewrite the music before I punch you, violently. Will do. Also featuring world-renowned artists from the 90s, Shakira. Shall we dance dance? On a bright cloud of music, shall we dance? Uh, cut recording. Russell, you're doing a great job. Um, but do you think you could try it this time with a, a little more emotion? Right. Here's what I was thinking. I was thinking maybe I could squint my eyes and frown. How about that? Or maybe you could try something else. I don't think so. No, he's right. 
Order now, and you can get other Hollywood sensation Gerard Butler singing your child to sleep with nursery rhymes. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. I was the phantom. The King and I, sung by Russell Crowe, because, by God, somebody has to humor him. And done to them! <laughs>
till death. I cannot believe you do this. Down, down, down. <laughs> Father, no. Um, this might be really inappropriate, but seeing how this is a Rankin Bass production, during this scene, could we play this? Where there's a whip, there's a way. Where there's a whip, there's a way. We don't want to go to war today. Oh, if you know the story, you know he can't bring himself to do it. But he does order her to be sent back to Burma. Why'd you say Burma? I'm panicked. But the prince and her escape and try to run away. Go to the ancient place of the elephants. Bring back their bodies after the <laughs> accident. There's going to be an accident? Oh, yes. You know, guy, you keep coming up with these complicated ways to seize power. Have you ever thought about just going up to a really powerful nation and being like, DRAGONS! I CAN MAKE DRAGONS! GIVE ME ALL YOUR SHIT! So the servant falls into the Pepsi Cola River, but luckily the king has his air balloon to try and save the day. I must save her so I can give her proper whipping! Krala Holmes sets the balloon on fire while the king is still inside. Thanks for asking. All things considered, I couldn't be better, I must say. Hmm. <clears throat> Sir Edward, I can't explain this. Um, the dragon. So the family goes to look over the damage. Well, the panther has given his prognosis. He's definitely dead, folks. I will say when it's time to cry. So he apparently lives in this version, and Anna even seems to stay behind. You could make the argument that this is totally spitting in the face of history, but the other versions seem to do that already. This is more a scrotum shaving of history. Painful, insulting, and not nearly short enough. And I think those are the perfect words to describe this movie overall. Whether you like the original musical or not, I think everyone can agree this is beyond a serious downgrade. The child-friendly additions are so painful and so out of place that I keep expecting to see the Saturday TV Funhouse logo pop up from SNL. I've learned more about Thailand by eating at a Thai restaurant. It cares nothing for its main characters and instead wants to focus on its comedic side characters, which even then aren't really that developed either. And when we get down to it, it doesn't even make any sense. Why make a kid-friendly version of something like this anyway? Did they really think there was going to be a big enough crowd for it? All I can say is you won't see me trying to cash in on some dying musical fad. I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember it so you don't have to! It was never funny to begin with! Stop it! The wall's the wrong color. Oh, that was good though. Oh, <laughs> okay. Who, who, who? 